Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Sebastian Kim is a world leader in the research of public theology, world Christianity, and Asian expressions of faith. He's written numerous books on these themes. He's deeply interested in the relationship between peace building and reconciliation and Asian theology today. Sebastian Kim writes extensively on forms of public theology, emerging Christianities in Asia, and the way in which this engages world Christianity today. He engages theology and peace building at some of the most prestigious universities in the world. Sebastian Kim, welcome to the Global Church Project. Can you tell me something about your ministry at uh, York St. John College mm -hmm. and how you ended up in this kind of role? Uh -huh. um, well, um, uh, my role is the chair in theology and public life. Mm. Um, just briefly, if I can mention mm. my background. Mm. Um, I am from South Korea mm. and uh, I studied engineering, but mm. uh, later I decided to join the Christian ministry. And so I went to the uh, theological seminary, that's the uh, Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Korea. Mm. And uh, I did a Master of Divinity and then the, uh, uh, and then went to Fuller to do a uh, Master of Theology. Mm. Uh, and then I went to India. Uh, that was quite an uh, important um, experience of my theological life or the ministry. Um, in India, I went to, in India in 1993, um, I went to the uh, theological seminary called the uh, Union Biblical Seminary. Uh, so I taught there for four years, and that was um, a really a turning point of my life, coming mm. from a small country of South Korea and uh, staying and living in with the uh, colleagues in India with a very multicultural and multi-religious setting, uh, mm. which opened up my horizons. So from there, I start to formulate about the kind of law of uh, Christian theology in the mm. public life and uh, so con I continued to do some research particularly on religious conversion um, mm. because that's quite a sensitive issue in India. Mm. Um, I studied and did res research on debate between religious thinkers and also Christian theologians mm. on the issue of religious conversion. Um, it's a fascinating subject because mm. people have their own rationale to argue against conversion mm. and whereas Christian theologians uh, want to argue for conversion. Um, so that went into the very public, it was a public debate uh, through decades. Mm. Um, so through studying that subject, uh, I again start to formulate uh, my idea of uh, uh, public mm. law of Christian theology. Mm. And then I moved to <coughs> uh, uh, the UK to do my research, uh, PhD research. And uh, I did uh, a PhD in Cambridge and uh, the, on the subject of religious conversion. Uh, and also I, uh, after that, I taught uh, there for uh, nearly five years on various subjects, uh, world Christianity and also the, uh, the, the liberation theology and Asian theologies. There I found that the, again, is the importance of the uh, uh, public law uh, in the Christian life and the church. And I moved here about 10 years ago mm. and uh, now I'm chair in the th uh, theology and public life Basically, mm. my role is the relating theology into the public life, mm. that is, economic, political, and social cultural issues, mm. and uh, try to associate and try to interpret and try to uh, present Christian insights into the public life, mm. because uh, currently, it, the, the current Western context, mm. uh, Christian church tend to be marginalized and mm. the Christian uh, faith uh, tend to be regarded as a private faith, private matters. And I firmly believe that is a, is a, although the 
in spite of weakness and in spite of shortcomings, Christian mm. theology and Christian church mm. have a, 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 a huge insight to offer uh, to the society. Mm. Yeah. Religion is often privatized in the West, uh -huh. but you talk about the importance of public theology engaging in a pluralistic, um, you know, consumerist, mm -hmm. multi-religious society. Right. <clears throat> Why do we as Christians need to have a, a, a humble boldness mm -hmm. in the way in which we engage in public theology and, and public life? Mm -hmm. I think there's a the, uh, lot to do with our past, mm. perhaps in the West, because mm. of the Christian dominance for many centuries. Mm. And I think people react against anything to do with the religion. Uh, because of the dominance of the church and dominance of the uh, religious ideas and some negative effect in the society and also in the worldwide uh, because of the Christian missionary activities often hand hand with the uh, colonial uh, power. So you do have some negative uh, attitude toward the religions particularly in Europe and uh, for example in, you get the uh, France case, French case, uh, mm -hmm. you have a concept about laicite. Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, if you like, c quite aggressive form of uh, secularism. Mm -hmm. And anything to do with the religious thinking and religious ideas, uh, they tend to push toward a uh, private realm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's why uh, uh, it is important to uh, re-discuss and reassert the importance of religious thinking. But having said that, and I think we do have, uh, we, we have to acknowledge that we don't have uh, every answer for the public issues and social issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, our insights and our knowledge is, is, has uh, uh, limited implications. Uh, perhaps in the medieval period, church declared, uh, or church mm -hmm. Uh, pretend that we do have an answer, <laughs> all the answers, um, but in the in in the uh, present context in the twenty first century, we have to acknowledge that we have uh, a limited options, a limited insights. Uh, therefore, we should be uh, humble on mm. our uh, uh, bringing our insight into the public life, and uh, I think that's quite important to have that attitude. But at the same time. We shouldn't be just uh, accept the secularist accusation or secularist mm. of the uh, notion that religious thinking, religious ideas are just a virus, therefore mm. should stay in the private realm. And I think looking at the history of Western civilization and uh, many also parts of the world, the impact of the Christian church has been enormous and uh, 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 talking about the positive impact uh, mm -hmm. in, in Western society and also around the world. Um, for example, in terms of education, the many of the uh, top quality universities and colleges are founded by missionaries and Christian churches. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example of how Christianity has contributed mm -hmm. a great deal in the public life. Mm -hmm. Uh, therefore, I think we should be also bold enough to mention, say that uh, we have something to contribute, mm. we have insights, um, we have uh, also moral and theological obligation to be involved in mm. public life. So our contribution mm. needs to be uh, humble and generous and conversational. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And how can public theology help promote critical inquiry and open debate? Um, I think the, that's the quite the key uh, uh, mm. concept for our public mm. theology, the mm. critical inquiry and open debate. And uh, that idea is perhaps we can identify uh, with the Jürgen, Mo, uh, Jürgen Habermas, mm. uh, who uh, wrote a quite a significant book in the uh, structural transformation in the public sphere. Mm. And I think that's the quite a significant book and also his philosophy on the public sphere 
uh, if I may just expand his ideas, mm. because um, he identified that the, in the public sphere, you have a state and market, which are the kind of dominating power, whereas you have a family and private uh, sectors. Uh, but he wanted to see the kind of in the between, you have certain sphere, that's what he calls mm. in the public sphere. And he discussed some of the uh, late 18th century or 19th century, the Europe, Britain and uh, Germany and other parts of Europe. The people created this kind of sphere where they can study and they can discuss and they can debate and even they can do the, some advocacy uh, toward the authority. I think that's the beginning of the, what you call civil societies or the kind of public sphere. Uh, so that's quite an important concept. And he sees that in order to maintain or in order to promote those kind of sphere, you need to have this uh, uh, critical inquiry and open debate. And uh, that's quite an important uh, concept. And uh, that continues in the uh, idea of the civil societies and what we call the public sphere. Now, there are many people discuss about the, what do we mean by public sphere and who mm -hmm. are the uh, main players and so on. And um, I think I would say that, that there are at least six major bodies in the public sphere. There's uh, uh, state and market and the media and then religious communities and civil societies and then the academia. I would say that's a six uh, mm -hmm. um, major players. And public theology tend to sit in the academia uh, working with the, closely with the religious communities in terms of Christian theology is obviously the Christian mm -hmm. churches, but works very closely with the civil societies in order to participate in the public sphere because in the modern society, particularly, let's say, Western uh, modern societies, state, market, and media are the dominating bodies, mm -hmm. and they tend to dominate in the public discussions and making public policies. Mm -hmm. And public theology tend to try to work with the various different bodies in order to participate in the, uh, for the public good. Uh, because although you have a state, uh, various forms of state and governance and also the economic systems, um, when it comes to liberal democracy, you tend to side with the majority. I mean, that's the nature of the uh, uh, democracy. And, but it tends to be in danger of going to the majoritarianism. Uh, and neglecting the rights of the minorities and the poor and marginalized. And public mm -hmm. theology tried to promote the participation of various different groups in the public sphere. Mm. What are some of the other key features of public theology today? Um, public theology, in the, when it comes to mm. the, the idea of public theology, is the basically uh, formulated by the uh, Martin Marty from the States. Yeah. Um, he's a historian and he wrote uh, a public church and uh, also discussed the, some of the public law of the different churches. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, he identified the Catholic Church, uh, the main nine ecumenical church and evangelical church, mm -hmm. the three different uh, churches, how they engage in the public life. Because, as you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the America, you have quite a uh, uh, discussion on the church and state relations between these two. Uh, so he pushed the idea of public church, therefore start to use the term public theology. And so we have a quite a number of uh, theologians, particularly like Catholic theologians, John Courtney Murray, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, the protest circle, you have Mark Stackhouse, and then you have uh, uh, Donald Tiemann and various scholars. Now, in the, the American scholarship, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, kind of uh, individual uh, 
uh, theologians or church leaders promoted mm -hmm. this idea of public theology. Uh, but recently, um, there is a group called the uh, Global Network for Public Theology, that's GMPT, uh, that has been formed about 10, 15 years ago. I think that's the now is a kind of driving force to research, to do research and to engage in public theology uh, around the world. So we have uh, uh, various centers around the world in America, number of centers, and then mm. in Europe, uh, here in the UK, and also continental Europe. And then in Australia, we have uh, uh, the uh, various centers uh, in Australia, as well as in South Africa. So that's the kind of key centers mm. uh, around the world. Mm. Now you've done a bit of research on uh, world Christianity as well. Uh -huh. and. You talk about the way in which World Christianity helps us understand the Bible as a public book. Uh -huh. Can you describe what you mean there? Yes, um, the, in many ways that's the, quite a fascinating area. I mean, I mm. would like to do some more research on mm. that. Uh, but when mm. I say that it's a public book, is the, when the Bible was introduced to the uh, many parts of the world, that book was uh, first introduced not as a, just a necessarily religious book, mm. but also it was providing the wisdom and some kind of moral guidance to the general mm. public. Um, so it wasn't accepted as just for the Christians, but for the general public. I mean, for example, the stories in the Hebrew Bible or Testament, you have various uh, fascinating stories. And those stories did not just stay in the Christian circles, but it was passed on to the general public to, mm. for the inspiration and for the getting wisdoms and so on. So mm. story of Moses and story of uh, Joseph and the various uh, stories. And also the uh, teachings of Jesus and uh, St. Paul, mm. you have this kind of insightful teachings and that has been transmitted to the uh, various other people and various other societies. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've done some work on the African context. Of course, Africans loved stories. And many ways also the stories in the Hebrew Bible, you have very similarities mm -hmm. in, the, in terms of context and in terms of family ties and the communities. And that really gives them the, the kind of inspiration and insight and wisdom. And uh, when it comes to the Indian context, Indians uh, 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 draw the inspiration from the uh, story of Jesus and also life of Jesus. And then the connect with the Hindu ideas of uh, various spiritualities so uh, they, they are very much into the Gospel of John, how mm. the Gospel of John interprets mm. uh, Jesus' teaching and life. And I think that's a, f a tremendous insight uh, for Indians, not only Indian Christians, but many of the Indian thinkers, for example, mm. Ram Mohan Roy, although he remained a Hindu, mm. but he was very much attracted by the Jesus' teaching. And mm. even he wrote a booklet on the uh, teachings of Jesus mm. and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a summary of the teachings from the Gospel. Mm. And Mahatma Gandhi, as you know, that uh, he was very much inspired by the teachings of mm. Jesus. So you do have a lot of interactions in the uh, uh, non-Western world uh, in terms of teachings from the Bible and also the stories and insight from the Bible. In the case of Korean context, uh, Koreans, uh, because of the, their tradition of Confucian teaching, uh, Koreans tend to memorize and strictly follow that teaching once they believe it is right. Mm. Um, so you do have a very strong tendency to the uh, following the teachings of uh, Jesus and the Bible. So there are various different characteristics, mm. um, but it's fascinating to see how Bible is being used in the public sphere and also the 
uh, uh, that is the kind of uh, uh, meeting point between mm. Christians and uh, uh, non-Christians. That's very interesting because in the West we've tended to privatise our uh -huh. reading of or interpretation of scripture. Yes, Even in the sure. life of the churches we've tended to, to privatise it right. recently at uh -huh. least. Um, but as we look at world Christianity we see that public theology in world Christianity is drawing its authority and inspiration from uh -huh. scripture. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm. yes. I think that's, uh, that's the, one of the areas uh, we still need to uh, do more research mm. and more work on that. I mean, mm. particularly when it comes to the idea of wisdom literature, mm. that's again a very fascinating area mm. because wisdom literature, although it is in the mm. religious text, it is the, the Hebrew Bible, it is a religious text, but they draw the sources from various secular sources around mm. the ancient mm. Near East and also the they address to the wider audience, not only just the people with a faith, but it is a common knowledge, but common teaching, pursuing the common good. So I think that's the quite fascinating area that how we use Bible uh, directly to address to the people in uh, 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 the kind of beyond the kind of church circles. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of public theology is we try to discover or try to do more research on the methodology of how Christian insights can be transmitted to the mm. wider audience directly. Um, because the uh, traditional Western theologies and uh, traditional theology tend to address the Christians, uh, tend to assume that you have a faith um, so, like the uh, doctrine of Trinity and uh, various different theologies, uh, in order to understand or in order to fully appreciate, uh, you do need a certain degree of faith. And also the Western theologies have been developed in the context of Christians uh, being majority, mm. but now the situation has changed. Mm. Therefore, we do need to develop the methodology to address non-Christians uh, with the faith and without faith to understand insight from the scripture and insight mm. from theology. And I think you say that that can only be done in a conversational, mm -hmm. dialogical way, that mm -hmm. there's no other way really to do public theology well today. Um, I wouldn't say there is no other way, yeah. but I would like to emphasize yeah. the, the conversational way mm. because um, Public theology is the, we need to we need to come with a uh, kind of uh, not with attitude as a as a we are prophet. Therefore, mm. we've got moral high ground. We've got something to offer. Mm. Therefore, we'll give it to you. And I think that kind of attitude uh, the wouldn't be acceptable mm. in the kind of public mm. sphere. And I think everybody need to come with a humble and uh, a limited knowledge, mm. but it has to be engaged in dialogue with the other people mm. and other people with other faith and mm. people with uh, uh, the, 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 the none. Mm. So I think that's the kind of uh, way to engage in. And we also would like to promote the idea of debate and advocacy. Mm. So if we have uh, ideas, we mm. bring it into the public sphere and have an open debate and see uh, and learn from each other and uh, present our case. Um, if the majority of people, people accept that idea, that's we can move toward uh, that direction. But if not, I think we do need to constantly reshape our thinking. Mm. Mm -hmm. How is public theology different than say political theology or liberation theology? Uh -huh. Um, yes, um, the, um, I mean, the po political theology and liberation theology and public theology, the three theologies are quite a recent, relatively recent yeah. discourse. Mm. And we do share quite a lot of uh, uh, common uh, premises. I mean, for example, the idea of critical theory uh, coming from mm. the Frankfurt School in the 1930s, the idea of challenging the kind of traditional mm. Uh, pursuit of knowledge and philosophical understanding of certain mm -hmm. subjects 
and I think the contribution of the Frankfurt School is the you want to see the uh, 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 kind of critical assessment of what you do. So mm -hmm. is a knowledge is not enough. The kind of implication of or application of knowledge is important. Therefore, you mm -hmm. want to see the transformation of society through that knowledge. Uh, I think that's quite important. Both uh, political theology and liberation theology inherited that. Mm -hmm. And of course, the public theology also use the idea of critical theory into the theologizing. Mm. Now, when it comes to some differences, I would like to say that uh, particularly liberation theology and mm. public theology, because they all share similar uh, premises, uh, but the, when it comes to the difference between liberation theologies and public theology, when I say liberation theologies, uh, includes uh, Latin American liberation theology, black theology, family theology, minjung theology, and Dalit theology, and so on. Um, whereas public theology different is that the liberation theologies uh, tend to emphasize the revolutionary approach, whereas public theology is more reforming. In other mm. words, liberation theology see this, the system itself mm. is, is wrong and uh, something you need to change the system itself. Whereas public theology sees the system itself is not necessarily wrong and evil. You want to work within the system but try mm. to reform it. Um, for example, liberation theologies are brought or they, they started out of the uh, military backed governments or mm. military dictatorship. Mm or when you see the feminist discussions or black theology, you see that the wrongness of the system, so you want mm. to change and challenge the system. So that's the quite difference. And then you have certain emphasis, of course it's a bit the dividing these two groups, it's a bit arbitrary, but uh, um, liberation theologies uh, to see uh, more the just, and uh, 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 equal society, whereas uh, public mm. theology emphasized uh, fair and open society. They're all similar, but the emphasis are mm. quite different. And the liberation theologies tend to stand for the marginalized and the poor and so on, whereas uh, public theology tend to negotiate and tend to debate through the uh, advocacy mm. and the open debate. So that's a quite mm. uh, different approach. How do these different theologies help us appreciate the hermeneutical openness mm -hmm. of the Bible in pluralistic contexts? Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the, the, the challenge of the liberation mm. theology, I mean, I often teach liberation theology in this university and mm. also previous universities. Um, the strength of liberation theology is the um, their hermeneutical tool is the is a kind of critical assessment and uh, also hermeneutics of suspicion. So mm. you always challenge whenever you have uh, knowledge and tradition, you challenge that tradition and the context and also the, the mm. ideas behind that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the argument. So I think that's a quite the important aspect of the theology. You always need to critically assess what you know and what you do. And also the idea of the hermeneutical circle, that the, you start with the text or you start with the context, but you always need to come back to the text or go back to the context. So you need to reflect your texts in the light of the context situation, but at the same time, that situation need to go back to the text and reflect the scripture. So I think that as a, as a Christian theology, that's the that's a crucial uh, for mm. us to have that hermeneutical circle. Now, when it comes to the public theology, uh, again we use a lot of insight from the critical theory. Now one of the best uh, example or best uh, theologians uh, I could mention is the Edward Skilibix, who is a, a Dutch theologian. Um, he was very much into the critical theory. In fact, he was in conversation with 
uh, Jürgen Habermas, mm. and uh, he developed his own theology uh, on the basis of the critical theory. So he sees the hermeneutical tools or hermeneutical pursuit that many of the uh, traditional mm. theologians pursuing uh, was not enough. So understanding correct mm. theology or uh, biblical hermeneutics is not enough. He wanted to see that hermeneutical uh, the findings need to transform the church as well as the world. Mm. And I think that uh, he wants to pursue that. That's the very much importance. Therefore, uh, public theology wants to uh, appreciate the hermeneutics, uh, both mm -hmm. philosophical and systematic approach to understand mm -hmm. the scripture and theology, but also that need to, the public theology wants to translate into the public life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder if we can think about some specific contributions of uh -huh. specific public theologies. So, mm -hmm. eco-theology or Latin American or peacemaking, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you see some specific contributions being made as exemplified in these theologies? Yes, yes, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I mean, just a couple of examples I can think mm. of. Um, I mean, for example, in the historically, um, you have an example of, let's say, um, just world theory mm. uh, is the very, very uh, uh, old theory, but it is uh, done by the Christian theologians um, and uh, that was uh, very much influential mm. to the policy makers on the ethics of the world and ethics mm. of the engagement of the world and ethics of prevention of the world and uh, even uh, very recently uh, people were debating when talk about the Iraq war, people were debating on the basis of that. So that's the one of the examples of the Christian theologians mm. where theological thinking can shape the uh, uh, politics mm. of the conflict and so on. And then uh, uh, the other example is the talking about the anti-slavery campaign in the early 19th century, um, the William Wilberforce and the Thomas Clarkson, and those people were evangelical Christians, uh, but they are very much inspired by the, the idea that uh, the image of uh, uh, human beings are created by the image of God, and therefore we are equal. So they are inspired by the scripture, uh, and campaigned against that. Particularly, I mean, we do know the William Wilberforce very well. He was MP, uh, uh, not far from here is yeah. her, and uh, he was uh, 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 very much uh, uh, a campaigner. So he was a uh, 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 forefront runner of the campaigns. Uh, but I would like to highlight the uh, the uh, Thomas Clarkson. Uh, which is, who is not very well known person, mm. but Thomas Clarkson was the more academic. He did all the research. He visited uh, various ports like Bristol, London, Liverpool. There was kind of center ports for the slave trades. So the uh, slaves were brought into the uh, west coast mm. uh, uh, of the England, and then the 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 uh, the slave traders where where the they organize that and then send it to America or various other parts of the world. So they received a huge profit there. Mm -hmm. So Thomas Clarkson visited these places and then interviewed the um, captains and uh, sailors and so on, the situation of the ships, the slave, sh mm -hmm. slave ships just like what you're uh, doing yeah. now. But uh, is the fascinating thing is that he researched all these interviews and summarized and uh, produced the booklets. And, mm. and he used to promote the anti-slavery campaign that. And many of the general public, although they knew about some badness of the slave trade mm. and so on, but they received huge profits. So they mm. turned blind eyes that, and they didn't really know the in and outs of the slave trade. 
but he actually interviewed and how many slaves were killed, died on the process, mm -hmm. that's, that's the inhumane conditions and so on. So he campaigned out of that solid research. Mm -hmm. And I think that really mm -hmm. affected. So of course, William Wilberforce was MP mm -hmm. and a very outspoken figure, but he had this friend, Thomas Clarkson, mm -hmm. who did the groundwork and campaigned, and that really mm -hmm. helped. Um, perhaps the other, one other example, the recent example is mm -hmm. the, uh, I don't know how much you're aware of this uh, Make Poverty History campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, that's again, I would like to say that's the part of the public theology in action, because the Make Poverty History campaign was the, uh, initially it started in the mm -hmm. uh, campaign of Jubilee 2000 campaign, that's the uh, 1998 in Birmingham uh, when the G8 uh, uh, leaders were mm. meeting in Birmingham. Mm. Uh, Christians gathered together, so I joined there with uh, our church mm. members. So most of the, uh, many of the Christians went there and campaigned for the releasing or cancel the debt of the poorest nations in Africa. Uh, I think that was really uh, beginning of the campaign of the uh, challenging this idea of the uh, debt issue and ask the political leaders to reconsider mm -hmm. and to to really uh, see the uh, kind of difficulties the most, many of the African uh, countries mm -hmm. are facing. And then that campaign uh, uh, continued in the 2005 mm -hmm. in Edinburgh when G8 uh, again met there, and uh, it's about a quarter of a million people were gathered there to campaign for the uh, li uh, cancel the debt as well as the fair trade and so on. Yeah. Um, there was a tremendous uh, campaign, and uh, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, the political leaders decided after the, the campaign decided to cancel uh, certain mm -hmm. aspects of the uh, debt. Mm -hmm. So that's quite uh, uh, fascinating to uh, see. And, and I suppose when we look at the successes and the failures mm -hmm. of various public theologies uh -huh. and campaigns, it shows us that it needs to be a very dynamic mm -hmm. process if it's going to be authentically public theology. Sure. Yes, yes, mm. I mean, that's true. And uh, I mean, public theology, I would say, yes, it's a, mm. it's, it, it, it will sit into the, let's say, systematic theology or church ethics, Christian ethics or social ethics, but at the same time, it is also sit in the what you call practical theology mm -hmm. circle, because um, although we talk about it and theologize it, unless we mm -hmm. actually participate in the discussions and debate and dialogue, I think that's the loose. Uh, momentum, it loses the strength of the argument. Uh, therefore, what I do here, that's the uh, uh, part of my work is working on the academic work on the writing papers and so on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do engage in the various projects here. So for example, we have an Evo lecture series, mm -hmm. invites politicians and various policymakers and various different uh, uh, section of the society to speak on certain issues and people raise questions and discuss about that. And then also uh, idea of peace mm. and reconciliation, that's one of the projects uh, we do, uh, how to really engage in the uh, peace building in conflict mm. areas. So we, we don't just invite uh, theologians or academics, but mm. we invite uh, the practitioners and policy makers and people who are actually working in the ground and to mm. discuss together so that theory and practice should mm. interact with each other. And in your writing you also talk about some controversial cases too, mm -hmm. so um, regarding Sharia law and, and right. other things. Yes. So, yes, that's right. Um, yeah. Are there any examples of controversial cases which illuminate for us the role of public theology and how it works today? Yes, I mean, I, yes, I do, mm. I, I do like to look at the debate, yeah. because that's the, 
my first book is the debate on religious conversion mm. in India. So mm. I, I, I liked it, this idea of debate because that's a key issue for the public theology, developing mm. public theology, to see the uh, both sides of argument rather mm. than just uh, decide to side of the one argument because mm. when people are engaged in debates, uh, people have their own reason, rationale, and mm. the philosophical background, and so on. Mm. Um, so I'm looking at these various uh, uh, debates in recent years. Mm. I mean, for example, the uh, 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 Archbishop then uh, Rowan Williams uh, lecture on Sharia law. That's very fascinating because the, the lecture itself is fascinating, but the reaction. Uh, to that lecture was um, almost universally uh, very critical on his lecture, partly because of uh, his kind of sympathetic view on the application or implication mm. of Sharia law into the uh, British uh, legal system, uh, and partly because of the, some of the negative view on Sharia law itself. Uh, but I think the important issue that uh, Rowan Williams brought in that uh, lecture was the, his, what he called the uh, interactive pluralism. And I think that's quite an important concept. Uh, although I may not agree with his notion of implication of Sharia law into the British uh, legal system, mm -hmm. uh, but his idea of interactive pluralism is very important because mm -hmm. he sees the importance of the religious communities to participate mm -hmm. in the public life. So it's kind of mm -hmm. twofold. One is that he wants to challenge government to accept the contribution and the participation of the religious mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. including Muslim mm -hmm. communities and various different uh, uh, minority religious communities in this country. But at the same time, he wanted to see the openness of the religious communities into public life. Because once you become privatized or pushed into the private realm, then it becomes more, tend to be more radicalized. Mm. And the, many of the radical thinkings can permeate into that kind of exclusive ideas or exclusive mm. realm community. So I think it's important the religious communities to mm. be more open to the mm. public life so that you have some kind of healthy interactions. Otherwise, uh, many of the uh, fundamental thinking or militant mm. thinkings are often associated with a very exclusive uh, community. And this shows the role of public theology again that um, mm. Regardless of what we think about a particular issue, uh -huh. like this one, mm. public theology wants to encourage this open inquiry and critical debate right. about the issues. Right. Yes, yes. Mm. I think that's the both sides, and particularly in the secular uh, mm. setting, uh, mm. people tend to regard religion as a private matter, therefore mm. it's just the spiritual issues mm. and religious issues and so on. Uh, but that has, as I said, it's a very mm. uh, two implications. One is it deprives uh, from the deprives of, deprive the the wider society to gain this insight from religious traditions, mm. because religious traditions have been going you know, on for centuries and centuries. Mm. They accumulated the inspirations and insights, and wisdom from that tradition. And that should be utilized into the wider society. Mm. But at the same time, religious communities need to be open. I think mm. many of the instances, mm. particularly in the uh, Muslim communities in Europe, uh, recent kind of conflicts, mm. is a lot to do with the, this kind of um, differing value systems and different mm. concept of how we understand religion in the public life. Mm. and. Uh, uh, I think we need to have a lot more interactions between the two uh, mm. groups. Uh, that's why I'm very much interested in this relationship between religious communities and the wider society, mm. particularly secular society. And as you research world Christianity, uh -huh. you notice that there's been some striking changes going on. Mm -hmm. well, what are some of the things that stand out to you as you look at world Christianity today? Um, I think the first of all, it is quite a uh, fascinating to see the kind of uh, 
um, shifts of the uh, uh, numbers and uh, mm. the kind of growth of the uh, churches mm. in the particularly Latin America in Africa mm. and uh, some parts of mm. Asia. But I would say that the more than that, uh, I think I tend to a little bit criticize on the looking at the numbers. Mm. Um, but I think the kind of insights from the, uh, uh, the, the world Christianity, that's uh, fascinating because um, the many of the Christians in the non-Western world, mm. uh, they lived in the context of the poverty and context of the political struggle and mm. many many of them are context of mm. the minority being minorities so they learned the insight of wisdom how to cope with uh, these uh, struggles mm. and suffering and therefore they easily identify with the stories in the Hebrew Bible and also the uh, various the persecutions the early Christians went through. Uh, I think that that's quite uh, important lessons mm. uh, for us to learn, uh, mm. particularly in the West. And also the idea of religious being in the kind of living in the religious majority uh, mm. that the Christians in the West perhaps is quite a new experience, mm. uh, but the many of the uh, non-Western world, that's the kind of everyday life. Mm. So how to cope with that and how to relate neighbors, mm. that's a very important lessons. Mm. And particularly, I mean, I lived in India for uh, about mm. five years. Uh, it's fascinating to see how mm. Indian Christians interpret and also the associate with the neighbors, Hindu neighbors, mm. and the theologists are coming out from there. Mm. It's very creative and very uh, fascinating how the uh, Christian theology interprets the situation and mm. adopt uh, that. Mm. Yeah. How do things like communion and Bible and spirituality and mission mm -hmm. provide global meeting points? Um, yes, I think that's the uh, some of the key components because mm. as you, I look at the world Christianity, mm. It's, it's so diverse, and uh, I, mean, I remember my brother, when he first came into uh, UK, uh, he attended the uh, worship service in the Minster, and also we went to the, uh, oh yeah, we went to the, the, the church next door, the, uh, um, it's uh, quite a charismatic church, both Anglican church, um, he just uh, couldn't see the, 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 the same church mm -hmm. and so on. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, in Korea too, you have this, uh, within the church, you have very formal service, but at the same time, you have very informal prayer meetings and healing and so mm. on. So uh, there, are, there are lots of varieties uh, within the same tradition, but also uh, within the same nation or continent, uh, according mm. to the denominations mm. and according to the uh, various uh, uh, theological understandings. Mm. Uh, but kind of uh, communion and uh, all these aspects uh, binds together, particularly I would like to emphasize the, the scripture that's the key mm. for the Christians to share. Mm. And also I think we do have a, a same kind of shared ideas of mm. the mission, the idea of mission. Of course, the understanding of mission uh, differs from the, let's say, uh, uh, ecumenicals, from the uh, evangelicals and conservatives. Uh, but still, we have understanding of uh, mission, how the uh, uh, gods, uh, uh, the, the, the commissioned, and also the, we have obligation to share uh, our mm. faith with others. And uh, again, communion, uh, that's the, what we share with uh, uh, one another. So those aspects can uh, bind together as, as a Christian church. Mm. Do you have any thoughts about what the world future of Christianity might look like? Mm -hmm. What kind of tapestry are we looking at? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's a quite uh, uh, interesting uh, question. and. Um, Yes, it is, I mean, I can't really uh, predict, but the mm. discussion has been a uh, number of discussions. One of the two uh, key the, uh, 
protagonist of this debate on the uh, uh, mm. uh, future of the Christianity is that uh, one idea is came from the Philip Jenkins and mm. uh, his book is the next Christendom uh, so his argument is that basically churches in the north hemisphere and the churches in the south you have a certain confrontation and certain differences but churches in the south will uh, challenge and will kind of initiate some revitalization of the uh, north but basically he sees the, the relationship between two groups are a bit confrontational mm -hmm. as you have seen uh, kind of Lambas conference and various other uh, uh, tensions between the mm -hmm. uh, bishops in the north and the bishops in the south whereas the um, uh, Grace Davy who is the uh, Christian uh, socialist um, they wrote a book, it's the same year, interestingly, mm -hmm. 2006, it's the same year. Um, she wrote on the Europe, the exceptional case, and she's arguing that, uh, yes, there are some interactions, but the Europe is an exceptional case, and the development of Christianity in Europe is very different, so although you have very uh, new churches, charismatic churches and so on, is coming mm. from Africa and so on. But they are so different, so therefore there is a less interactions. So these two mm. uh, ideas are quite interesting to compare. Mm. Um, and my argument is that, uh, yes, that's the, that's the quite fascinating idea, but I think the, in my research, there are a lot more interactions between the churches in the north and the church in the south mm. and various denominations and so mm. on. And therefore, it is uh, fat, uh, always interactive and uh, what mm. David Bush uh, called it the mutual interdependence. Mm. So I think we are moving into the era mm. that we are more uh, kind of interdependent each other. Of course, financially, the Western churches and uh, some of the uh, Welsh churches have still financially strong, but we do have a uh, lot of interactions from the rest of the world. So therefore, it's not only just the numbers are growing in the rest of the world, but it is a theological thinking and leadership and also um, various interactions are taking place. So it's a, it's a fascinating, I would like to mm. see positively the future of the uh, world Christianity mm -hmm. uh, because that's the that's the uh, we share and the, our gifts and our insights and also our struggles uh, a lot more than uh, previous centuries. Mm. Sebastian Kim thank you for joining us at uh -huh. the Global Church Project. Uh -huh. Yeah thank you. Right thank you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com on our website you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.